Welcome back to Reimagine 2020. I'm Yona Hockhauser, and today I'm glad to be joined by Zach Seward, managing, Dir- managing editor sorry, at Coindesk. Zach, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, Yona, what's up, man? How you doing? Very good. Now, uh, first, give our viewers a little background about kind of who you are and, and how you got into this blockchain world. All right. Fair question. So I am just a journalist. I'm, a, I'm just a journalist by trade. So I, uh, I grew up in San Francisco. Uh, went to college in Chicago, kept moving east, uh, got into uh, public television, PBS uh, here in the States, uh, PBS NewsHour, worked as a, as a scrub, as a lowly production assistant, getting people's coffee and, and printing scripts and doing research and stuff like that. Uh, decided I'd roll the dice to go to grad school, went to J school for a year in New York, uh, did that, focused on public radio there actually, so uh, came out of J school and landed uh, a reporting job in the NPR system up in lovely Rochester, New York, upstate, snowy, good times. Uh, did that for a couple of years, got a similar radio reporting job uh, at the Philadelphia outpost of NPR, uh, did that for a couple of years. Then I segued over the online side and became an editor at a local tech news site uh, called Technically that did a lot of great work looking at uh, tech scenes through the lens of place. So, you know, tech communities in Philadelphia and Brooklyn and DC were kind of popping in the early 2010s, and we kind of covered that as the paper of record. Um, by way of my work there in, in Brooklyn, at our Brooklyn site, we ended up covering a lot of consensus and Ethereum early on. Um, so that was sort of my first, uh, my first taste of the, uh, of the crypto uh, reporting beast. And then, um, you know, one thing led to another. A colleague that I had worked with at Technically had since gone to Coindesk, and they were looking to scale up their editing ranks, put me in touch with, uh, you know, with my, my boss at the time, and, and things worked out. So I've been there since... Uh, let's see, November 2018, which is like 20 years in crypto years. Um, I'm a grizzled vet. And um, yeah, I manage a team of five reporters and we do all sorts of great reporting day in, day out on this crazy world that we call crypto. Mm-hmm, for sure. I mean, it definitely is wild. We're going to get into all of that. Uh, you mentioned, though, a side point that, that you worked at NPR um, in Rochester. Is that where they do the Tiny Desk concerts? I wish, man. That's in DC. That's in the mothership. Oh, I never you made missed, it up to the mothership out. level. I know. I missed out. Like there's some, I there's some tiny desk concerts that are like near and dear to my heart, but I never got to witness one in person, unfortunately. D- d- does crypto have a similar thing? You know, in in the coin desk offices, do you have I don't know, Vitalik coming through and and and, and writing out oh, some man. shit on the whiteboard? That would be crazy. We should do that. We should do like a coin desk tiny desk coin tiny desk. That's smart. I don't know. It'd have to be something fun like. I don't know. We should. We could do like a music series. Yeah, we're in the process of building out a new, a new office and a new studio. So, you know, I'm gonna pitch that. You might get, you might get a, resid- yeah. a residual check. Okay, if I don't that know how. Big. I don't know how musically inclined the crypto sphere is. Maybe stay away from the singing. I don't know. Maybe like small hackathons. I really. Yeah. It's kind of tough I mean, to, to, to yeah. plug it in here. I mean, Vitalik rapping that one time at whatever DevCon that was. Have you seen that video? I mean, that's a classic. Yeah, yeah, we, could do, we, could that do, awesome. we could do devs like freestyle like devs just freestyling and it just like, I, it'd be cool listen be people it. are talking about how we get mass adoption i guarantee watching a bunch of tech nerds try to rap oh, yeah. a battle i think that's that's mass adoption right right there just bars just bars on bars on bars that'd be i'm i'm into it all right let's, this is a good idea tiny desk coin desk edition we'll do it all right well now that we're speaking about coin desk and uh you know you mentioned that you did come originally from traditional media that now you're kind of working in, in the crypto news let's say um, what is, what's the state of crypto journalism today? You know, it, it, we're always talking, you know, most of our discussions with projects trying to see where the technology is, but, but where are we at, on the media end? Absolutely. Great question. Well, it's the thing that I love about the crypto news sector is just how competitive it is, right? Like, you know, crypto never sleeps 24 seven. People are dying for information that is accurate, like unfair, like unbiased and fair. And, you know, Coindesk fills that niche in the space, right? Like, you know, we're out here, uh, you know, trying to be the paper of record for an emerging industry. You know, we strongly believe that this is like, this is the future of money and it's worth documenting every step of the way. You know, that includes its fair share of pitfalls, be it scams and other, other type of nefarious activity. That also includes unpacking these ideas that are actually quite revolutionary. So uh, we try to play that, that, that middle ground. We want to be the public, the public sphere. You know, we don't have like an ideological bent in terms of which assets we favor. Uh, we want to be that big tent and uh, cover the cover the industry day in day out. You know, we do we do consensus every year, which is our big you know physical manifestation of that mission. Right, you get all the various crypto tribes together in Midtown Manhattan for uh, this the span of a few days, and you just talk about what's going on at that moment in time in this really exciting industry. 
Um, so I think we play that convener role. And I think, uh, you know, again, as you, know, you see, you see in this market, the bull and the bear cycles, right? And I think as we enter potentially a new bull cycle, uh, you know, the interest for mainstream publications is going to tick up. Um, and we hope to be that sort of uh, informed and knowledgeable outlet that goes a little bit deeper than, you know, the New York Times or, you know, Bloomberg who occasionally dabbles in the space. So um, remains competitive, remains really interesting. Every, every day of my job is, is a fun little uh, race battle game in a great arena uh, of people who just want information to make informed decisions on. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've sat in a, in a newsroom before and, uh, and, and there's, there's an issue, you know, you only have so many, so many people, so much uh, time to write articles to choose. So you essentially, as, as an editor, as the newsroom, you have to decide what you're going to cover. Um, and this is an issue that, that people already recognize with uh, Google, with Facebook, with these tech companies, they recognize that there's an idea of, of curation of news um, there. That's a little different because they're deciding which news you see. But, but also, like any news organization with Coindesk, you have to decide what news you're going to cover. Uh, how do you guys decide that? Is, is it purely by what's hot right then, what you feel is important? Uh, how do you guys pick your news sources? Story yeah, that's about. another great question. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an art, not a science. So what I would say is that, you know, and it's especially diff difficult in our space, right? Like it's a high, uh, you know, the barrier to really understanding this stuff is fairly high. So the thing that we try to do at Coindesk is, you know, we, we, we pull the greatest minds in the newsroom. We try to identify the key narratives of that moment. And if there's a particular story or update that fits into that narrative, then it's uh, more times than not, it's an easy yes in terms of coverage, right? So like, um, you know, documenting the newest automated market maker to emerge into the DeFi space or, you know, documenting the latest efforts to get a central bank digital currency off the ground. Those are some of the big, uh, the big topics that, um, you know, we tell in little incremental updates. And what we try to do with every story is to have that kind of zoom out moment, that third or fourth paragraph that tells you, you know, why you should give us the time to engage with this material. Like we owe it to you as a reader. Like we, we need to make a case for why you should read on. So typically we try to zoom out, provide what we call in the industry, the nut graph, which kind of situates this little update in the broader arc of a, of a narrative that we care about. So typically like if it's a story that is pitched and like you can kind of formulate, you know, your reporter, it's in your inbox, you're pitching it to your editor and you can kind of formulate why you can make the case to a reader that they should care about this. Uh, then it's, then it's typically a much more uh, easy process for me to assign that and get that out the door. Then something that's like a little fuzzy, that's kind of, um, you know, the, the greater importance is not as clear uh, to you on first glance. So I guess that's, that's the thing. Again, you know, we, we try to, you know how it is in crypto, like, you know, crypto Twitter is popping off about one thing, you know, it was DeFi yesterday and, well, no, it was DeFi two days ago, it's NFTs today and tomorrow it's going to be something else entirely. So it's always hard to try to keep up, but we like to try to plant a flag early and like, uh, you know, own the narratives as they emerge. Well, it's got to be really interesting covering this particular industry and field because when you look at, at you know, tradition, the traditional, let's say, financial world or, or even just the traditional news, um, there's, there's a clear differentiation between, um, let's say, hard, real political and financial news and then lighter, softer uh, celeb news and, and gossip. But it seems like most of the discourse, the discourse about the real hard finance in cryptocurrencies, the real projects, the real infrastructure happens over crypto Twitter, over beefs, over spats in public, um, which kind which, you know, in the real world would be considered a gossip news, but at the same time, it kind of, you know, uh, uh, falls under that hard news. So how do you guys handle that? You know, the, the combining or, or covering that, that weird, uh, I don't know, symbiosis of, of, of these two like, clashing ideas in the sphere. Yeah, so I mean, the space is defined by big ideas and big personalities, and sometimes that creates big beef. Uh, sometimes you can avoid that beef. Other times you want to unpack it, right? Like oftentimes these are, these are philosophical debates that are worth documenting and unpacking and providing analysis around. You know, we're not going to get into every fight between like, you know, I'm not going to name names, but we're not going to get into every fight between this guy and that guy. But, um, you know, sometimes it is worth, uh, you know, taking the pulse of crypto Twitter, taking the pulse of the conversation, and, you know, providing a little bit of informed analysis so that, you know, a reader can, um, you know, again, drill down to the big ideas that are often at the source of these beefs. Because I think like, yeah, I mean, 
that like these are big crazy ideas right like this is the future of money this is like reinvention of how value is transferred and stored and and who has access to those uh those conversations so like um people are right to feel passionate about these topics uh and if sometimes you know tempers flare up um they flare up i mean we don't want to be we don't want to be the we don't want to be the crypto gossip rag um more times than not we're hoping to deal in substance as opposed to flash um but it is a feature of the space right these are big ideas that are being bandied about and people get people call each other names um you can watch unfold on twitter every day so um it's something that we see but it's not something we dabble in always but sometimes you know you gotta unpack it you gotta you gotta you gotta say what everyone is talking about and why and sometimes it's mm -hmm. getting down to those big ideas that are at the source of these disagreements in the space well, I mean, like you mentioned, of course, the, the, there's major ideas here. Like there are people who are, you know, saying that they are going to revolutionize the financial industry. They're going to revolutionize the way you interact with banks. They're going to revolutionize money. Um, and, and, and the industry talks a really, really big talk. Um, and they, and they, get, they, kind of, they kind of get to because um, we let them because they really are dealing with, you know, such new technology that really does have potential to be very powerful. We're still trying to figure it out, how to make it useful, how to make it scale, how to make it, you know, get adoption. But the, the, the backbone, the infrastructure is there to, to actually, you know, disrupt real industry. Um, but it seems on the journalistic side, things are just same old, same old. You know, if I go to Coindesk, and it, it's fine. It's good journalism. I read an article. I get information. But it seems to be going about the same old journalism that's covering the same old technologies. Uh, do you think that this new innovative technology needs new innovative journalism as well? It's a good question. I think we've seen experiments around it that really haven't clicked just because of some of the adoption issues that we're facing. So I know civil was sort of like the grandest failed experiment in that arena, right? Like here was a newsroom that was powered by uh, the civil token. Uh, you know, it would give readers a way to engage and sort of have a stake in that newsroom. Um, again, just like the, the, the fact that this is still such a niche industry in terms of you know, crypto adoption and, you know, people's ability to be conversant in blockchain technology, like it's going to be hard to move that needle when um, that market isn't quite there yet. So I, I get what you're saying. And I think like, you know, something that I think news should experiment in our space is sort of like, um, what's it called? It's like uh, change logs and stuff like that, like just sort of like committing changes to the blockchain or something in a way that is uh fostering of transparency you know more times than not it's like you know an extra space after a, a yeah. period or like you know some we spelled someone's name wrong like horribly misspelled it or something like that so sometimes more, more times than not it's gonna be mundane updates like that but stuff like that i think um can show that we are uh, you know using some of these technologies that we cover day in day out and i think it's something that like at coin debts we're mindful of you know like me and my colleagues and some of my superiors are very mindful of like you know, how do we uh, practice what we preach? Like, how do we how do we avoid sort of creating some of like the data honeypots that, you know, traditional news outlets and other web publishers create by like asking for your name and your mom's maiden name and your email and your, you know, the birth certificate to your firstborn child and all that stuff. Like, we don't want to have to, we don't want to have to do that. So if there's a way that we can play in decentralized identity in a way that, you know, uh, avoid some of the failings of centralized web models, that'd be great. But again, like, I think the civil story and other experiments so far have showed that it's going to be hard to make that click, right? Like there's like, you know, micro tipping is another great example, right? Like, you know, uh, basic attention token with Brave, right? You can, you can tip publishers for stuff that they, that, you know, that you think is valuable. We, we did a story on that last year and we, we ended up actually using one of our business side colleagues as a source being like, yeah, so like, is, does this work? Like how much have we gotten on this? And we, we, cause we dabbled in it like three, four years ago and it was only something like 5,000 bucks. I forget the, I forget the initial number, but certainly that's not a model that can sustain high quality journalism for the space. So as much as I wish that there could be an easy answer to like tapping into some of these, the promising decentralized technologies that we cover day in day out to fund what we do day in day out. I think for now, yeah, we are pretty traditional in terms of like how we go about, you know, keeping the lights on. Um, so Good question. It's definitely something that we're mindful of. And I would be curious, like, I'd be curious actually from your, from your perspective as like an informed observer, like what do you think would be a good space for a news organization like us to dabble in, in terms of decentralized technologies? 
I'm glad you asked, Zach. Thanks so much. Um, <laughs> no so, problem. Anytime. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm usually on this side of the camera. I'm not I'm, yeah, I'm no, I get doing it. the asking. Sorry, you know. No, cool. I, I would say this thing. I, I think you're looking at it totally wrong. Uh, you were focused on the business model aspect, which you're right. Until the business world, um, until the financials and economics catch up, you know, it's going to be tough to, to, to make a new journalistic business model. Uh, I think that you guys in, in, old, in old journalism um, and in kind of old media could lean on it for the, the verifying source side. And, and, and what do I mean by that? Right now in media, there's a huge issue with fake news. And, and the issue is not that there is a lot of fake news. There is a lot of fake news. There's a lot of real news. The issue is uh, for the average person who in reality is too lazy to actually just take the five minutes to do some research and make sure what he's reading is real news. Because by the way, we both know that's not really the hardest thing to do, but people don't do it. They want it quick, they want it easy. So I do think that here in the, with blockchain and with this idea of uh, a public immutable ledger that everyone could see, um, there's ability to define in, in what's real and what's not real, what's real news and what's not real news. I, I was speaking to um, uh, the head of research at, at Chainlink the other day, and he was telling me about you know, how the power of oracles. You know, blockchain has a problem. Everything that's on the blockchain, everyone agrees is correct. The problem is how do you take information that's outside the blockchain and make sure that it's correct you're bringing into the blockchain? That's what oracles do. And so um, we kind of got talking on this idea for, for journalism and media where um, in that or Chainlink Oracle system, uh, the verifiers, the validators, uh, they all say what they think is true or false, and they build a reputation, and they stake their, their reputation, they stake their coin, they stake whatever. Uh, and what you do is you, you, you essentially, you built this decentralized system uh, that incentivizes people to agree on what is the truth. And so you mm -hmm. can apply that. I, I, could, I, I could, you know, I'm not sure exactly the and bolts how to apply that with you guys but you know you tell me if you were given a system um you know where it allowed not not just the community but but uh it incentivized any player any actor uh to verify what is true then you could have that check mark you know next to what's a true article would that not then solve the problem of fake news i think it'd be cool but i think that's i mean that's ultimately a very human problem right like Craig Wright is Satoshi Nakamoto. Like, does that mm -hmm. get a check or, or does that get an X? Like, if you ask some adherents of, you know, DSV and others, that would get a check. If you ask others who've looked at other things and some of the courts, you would get an X. So I think, like, there is there is subjective reality. And I think, like, I think that would be cool if there was, like, a chain link news oracle that could, you know, be a decentralized, like, arbiter of truth. But I think there's, like, going to be very few instances in which that would be so tidy if that makes sense well it's um, kind of like wikipedia so like, how, how, well, how does wikipedia yeah. do it today wikipedia how do they agree on anything you know yeah i mean they like they list sources and they have different mods and like you know different mods are are able to like you know say yes or no to whether or not this is adequately adequately sourced and like um you know there's something to be said for that right but at the end of the day it's about at the end of the day, unfortunately, you do have to you do have to rely on you know your reader's ability to suss out and weigh. Okay, this was okay. Three people said the exact same thing about what happened on Tuesday. That's good enough for me. I believe that to be true. One person says it was totally different, but three people says this is what happened. And there is a degree of like media literacy that I think um, the space is missing. Right? Like the cool thing about crypto is like a lot of people are self-taught like financial experts. There's a lot of like self-teaching in the space, you know, self-taught people who, who build projects in code, self-taught self economists, uh, economists essentially, right? So I think there is a degree of like self-taught media literacy that's not quite there yet. So like oftentimes it's kind of like, oftentimes it's hard to suss out like what's true and what's not and how to help people identify what's likely to be true in, in instances when it's contested. Um, mm -hmm. So I think when we can educate around media literacy i think it like serves us well uh, there's been a few examples like you know you know full disclosure like we were the victim of a major hoax in which one of our reporters thought he was talking to uh, someone from a prominent project that was involved in a prominent lawsuit and that person was not the person that they said they were uh, mm -hmm. and we retracted that story and wrote a long explanation of how we messed that one up and why um, 
hope, you know, that was a painful experience for us as an organization, but hopefully it was also educational for people in the space to understand uh, how we go about doing what we do. So, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully the next experiment, like hopefully the next experience with that isn't as painful, but other opportunities to educate about how media does its job within this space and more broadly, I think it's super important and we could probably be doing more of that, honestly. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, if you're speaking about, you know, people understanding how, how media works and how media does its job, uh, we're, we're, we're essentially, they're, we're still dealing with the advertiser uh, model. Uh, most of these uh, journalistic um, uh, uh, out outlets, you know, unless you're the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, you know, and you could get by uh, on a subscription-based uh, model, you're, you're going to be ad-based ad model. An ad-based model just means get as many eyeballs to your website as possible to, to, your, to your article. So how do you guys fight, the, you know, fight that? How do you guys balance that idea of we just want to get as, as, as many eyeballs with a clickbait uh, as possible, but also balance that with, hey, we want to tell a, a story and even, even you know, an important story that might not be the most exciting story. Yeah, I mean, so for good and bad, the majority of our, of our revenue comes from events. So um, like ads have been a smaller part of our pie for a long time. For a long time, ads were, so back in the day, like ads were on the site, we had programmatic ads, they were terrible, everyone hated them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we turned off ads for a long period of time. We just turned ads on like, like last week again. So, but there's been a period of about a year where we didn't have any online ad revenue at all. Um, the way that we make most of our money is by organizing events that people, you know, well, again, that companies pay to attend and, and, and demo at booths on the floor of the New York Hilton. So um, on the, as that relates to our readers, what I like to think is that creates a higher degree of like engagement threshold, right? Like you have to really give a shit about us and what we're doing day in, day out to like plunk down some money and go to New York and attend an event to learn something, meet new people, and hopefully come out ahead in whatever aspect you desire. So, um, you know, I think that events-based models tend to be a little bit more honest in that regard. Um, you know, if, it was, if we were just an entirely ad-based thing and we were sort of incentivized to pump out trash that got clicks, I think it would be a different conversation. I'm glad I don't work for an organization that, that does that. I mean, that's, that's not really the, the mindset. Um, I think what we see is that, you know, reputation is still the top currency in media, whether that's in crypto or elsewhere. Like I remember a couple of years ago, there was a report that came out about pay to play in crypto. And I was really happy that the place that I was just about to leave my old job to go work for was not on that list. So, um, you know, that stuff still plagues the industry. You know, people basically bribing editors and organizations to run favorable stories about their projects so they can pump their token and then like dump it on some unsuspecting like retail user down the road. Um, we're not part of that picture, which is fantastic. Like, you know, we, you know, I come from a very traditional journalism background. Like my boss comes from a very traditional journalism background from Amer American banker, another niche, you know, financial publication. So we sort of, um, our old media in that regard, right? Like we, mm -hmm. and, and we kind of, use, we kind of like that. That's kind of a point of pride. Like, you know, we, you know, we, we cover without fear or favor and, um, you know, getting eyeballs on the site to get ads for, to get ad revenue for us would be like a losing strategy every time and it would work. So um, for us, it's about like building as much currency around reputation and trust and like, uh, you know, providing good service day in day out and uh you know hopefully that leads to like an event attendee down the road or at the very least it leads to engaged reader who you know trusts that we're getting it right in 99 times out of 100 so i guess that's my thoughts on the matter and you know there's uh you know you, you said you come from traditional media and uh traditional journalism uh, and I think it's a very, under, I mean, obviously, I'm, I don't want to toot my own, like, you know, my own horn, but I think journalism is a very underrated field, um, not just of, of getting out information, but the way that you write it, uh, especially written journalism, the way you write it uh, could, could really add tremendous value um, and engagement to an article. So in your opinion, who's the most underrated journalist covering crypto today? And I'd prefer you not go in-house and choose a coin, a coin desk person, but if you have to, I'm, pretty, I'm contractually, it. I'm contractually obligated to shout <laughs> out my colleagues. I can't, I can't not give my teammates some love. Um, I'll start. Uh, I mean, I'll start in house, and then I'll go out of house. I mean, I love, okay. I love my team. Um, I have like a Swiss Army knife team. I have like Brady Dale, who's just an amazing man at uh, explaining complex topics. I have Lee Quinn, who is just amazing at finding great stories and telling them in compelling, well-sourced ways. 
I have Ian Allison, who is just like, you know, the, the enterprise whisperer who can like find the big scoops that no one wants to tell yet and get that on the page in a way that is sourced accurately. Uh, I have Nate DiCamillo, who just comes from like a traditional, uh, you know, again, from American banker, it comes from a traditional finance reporting background and is really strong at what he does. Uh, I lost my guy, Will Foxley, who was doing a lot of coverage around uh, decentralized protocols and DeFi and all that good stuff. He was on Ethereum developer calls, you know, finding that juice week in, week out. So, um, you know, that that's a that's a team that I have come to really respect and admire. I've learned so much from them over these last two years. Um, outside, let's see, outside of us, who am I going to even shout out to? Uh, let's see. <laughs> um, you know, I think she blurs the line between advocacy and solid reporting sometimes, but I would say that Cami Russo at the Defiant is doing really interesting work around the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, she's definitely a part of that community, but holds it accountable in a way that I admire and respect. I think that her work is strong. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a, I'm gonna give a, a quick shout out to, to FinTech Frank, Frank Parr over at the block. Uh, I think he's really well sourced and good at what he does. I like hanging out with him when I see him. I like giving him shit on Twitter, Twitter every once in a while. Um, and then, I mean, yeah, those are those are the folks that come to mind. I think um, I'm trying to think who else. You know, someone I really like actually um is the folks at the new york times i'm blanking on her name right now dang it she wrote the story where it was like everyone's getting rich but everyone's getting hilarious hilarious the rich and you're not oh, yeah <laughs> blanking on her name anyway she's a fantastic uh she's just a fantastic tech writer who like finds yeah. really great stories and dabbles in uh crypto and blockchain every once in a while i'm gonna remember her name and i'm gonna just like okay. shout it yeah, out in a little bit but uh, uh top top dog though yeah coindesk is tops man we we, yeah. we know what's going on like brady lee ian nate will the whole squad i t I, I take them over everyone else and, and now that we're now we spoke about journalism enough that everyone stopped watching I, now now that we're just yeah, sorry. new here uh, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Now, now, no, yeah. now just me new here i'd love to get your thoughts on DeFi. you know there's just, just two guys shooting the shit um yeah. i'd love to get your thoughts on, on DeFi here um uh, you know, right now, you know, it, it, obviously DeFi as a concept, decentralized finance holds tremendous potential to, you know, bank the young, the classic, you know, keywords, bank the unbanked and uh, open up finance to everyone. A lot of people like to call it open finance, uh, but that's not mainly what the main use cases for DeFi we've seen over the past month, two, three. Uh, it, it's been spe a speculative uh, yield farming. Um, what's your take on, on yield farming and uh, uh, as a whole? Well, I think DeFi is pretty cool. And I think DeFi, I think the, the secret sauce of DeFi is the ability to use your crypto assets without spending your crypto assets. And that's always been, it's, that's always been to me, it's like, you know, it, it's killer use case, right? And I think even before yield farming, it really was about borrowing money to make crazy bets on the markets, right? Like, yeah. without a doubt, like these are you know, well-capitalized players within the crypto industry who are taking out loans, uh, you know, they're committing assets to a platform, they're getting another set of assets in return, and more times than not, they're putting those assets to play in the market with the expectation that their return on whatever that asset is, is big enough to pay off whatever they need to pay on their loan. So um, as much as I would love for DeFi to be a story about, you know, my, my brother getting a car loan or like, you know, my, my folks refinancing their home mortgage, it's just not that yet. I mean, we may get there one day uh, and I think that'd be cool, but so far as in most, at, like as is the case with most things in crypto, it's just a vehicle for, <laughs> for speculating on price movement. So um, I think yield farming like is a little bit more democratic, right? Like I think like there is an, the ability for, you know, smaller yield farmers to like, you know, get out ahead in this space. I think it's still predominantly a whales game, but uh, yield farming to me um, is maybe a more democratic form of like speculating on crypto assets than tr than what DeFi had traditionally provided. So in that respect, I think it's interesting. Um, you know, we're certainly thinking about our usage of the term governance token right now. I mean, more times than not, I think growth token would probably be the more accurate way to describe these things. Um, free money, you know, people people respond to free money. Um, so when we see these things pop off, you know, now almost on a weekly basis, um, uh, it's really people responding to incentives. Um, and it's been interesting to track, uh, mm -hmm. over the summer, the summer of DeFi, you know, it feels like, it feels like compound just happened last week. It was like, you know, in June, yeah. June 15th, where I remember it fondly, wow. but ever since, ever since compound came on the scene, 
there's just been this waterfall of innovation that uh, you know gets people in the door and uh, and doing things on these these crazy platforms. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, uh, the, the, for for sure. I mean, if you look at it, you you mentioned this governance token and, and kind of how you want to yeah. call it growth token. I kind of want to get your your thoughts on that there because uh, especially once. Sushi swap, you know, kind of uh, forked off of Uniswap and added a governance token and, and, and got all that, uh, that value, uh, uh, you know, migrated over very quickly. Uh, the copycats came and, and now it seems we're as up and to that point uh, with yield farming, I would have said, uh, you know, people tried to compare it to the ICO boom, but I, I would always say, no, no, these are separate things uh, because with the ICO boom, you were you're kind of, you know, uh, promising this, this, you know, the grand value of this token where it doesn't yet have value. Um, and, 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 and with the yield farming, it's not doing that uh, uh, yet until it is, you know, now with the governance token, it essentially, like you said, it's, it's, it's incentives to get people to, to, to provide liquidity there. Um, but it, it's still most off, often, more, more, more often than not, there is no value to that governance token yet. And so it's speculation on the speculation, which is incentivizing on the speculation. Um, and so is there a danger now that, that, that now with this, uh, that, that besides the good that SushiSwap has brought because, you know, drove Uniswap to, to, to innovate, but is there now a danger that this could uh, once again sp kind of spiral out of control into just pure spamminess with everyone forking governance tokens, giving out governance tokens and, and presenting it as, as something it's not? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the concept of you know, governance sounds so high minded. It's like, you know, like this yeah. council of elders, like sitting around the table, you know, gov governing the future of this grand experiment. And, you know, there is something to be said for that, right? Like compound and the comp token, I think was well intentioned in that regard, right? Like, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's write ourselves out of the equation, you know, compound finance, compound labs, whatever the entity name was, you know, forget it. We're, we're talking to you guys, the keys, you, you call the shots. Um, subsequently i think that vision has has been lost right like we you know it, you know these are these these tokens do provide the ability to govern these protocols going forward but you know by and large that is not what they're being used for at this point maybe one day maybe one day you know maybe five years from now um you know it's a healthy community of people making decisions in a discord and voting their tokens accordingly uh, and i think that would be great but as it stands now i think um there's certainly a, a big carrot for people to dump dump crypto assets into these platforms. So uh, you know, and and again, we've seen some of the scamminess already. We've seen we've I think there's been a few reported exit ex, exit scams. Um, you know, certainly the whole drama around Sushi Swap and and Chef Nomi was an interesting one to cover. Mm -hmm. um, but again, these are you know these are interesting uh, ideas. At its core, these are interesting ideas. How do you govern a protocol without having to trust? A central body of decision makers, um, and I think like we're gonna see some ugly failures along the way. But if we can kind of keep sight of that big picture in mind, uh, it's certainly gonna be a story that's gonna continue to be worth covering, despite whatever scamminess we may encounter in getting there. So um, I try to keep that in mind when we're covering some of these new projects, right? Like here, this is a growth token at this stage, but uh, down the road, this may be a fantastic example of how uh, human organizations can uh, coalesce and organi organize themselves more efficiently. Right now, right now, we're definitely not there. Right now, definitely, that's definitely not what's happening. I just want to make that clear. But um, the vision is there, and um, we may see one or two of these things actually work. Mm -hmm. And you know, you mentioned that you started to call them growth tokens, and I, I saw even in some of the articles on CoinDesk, you start referring to them as, as growth tokens. Uh, that, that's an editorial decision. I mean, that's a, that's, you guys are deciding to take the narrative that these, that these projects are putting out and, and, and kind of shift it into your own narrative that it is a growth token and not a governance token. Now, I kind of agree with what you're saying, but um, what is your, you know, journalistic duty there? Uh, do you have to every time, you know, you write grow token, write in parentheses governance token or, or vice versa, you know, what is your responsibility as a journalist here uh, to put in your own opinion on, on, on what these are? Well, a journalist's primary constituency is always their readers. So we're, we're under no obligation to, you know, say what you say a thing is. You know, you call a dumb thing some dumb thing. We're not obligated to call it that dumb thing. You know, like if you call a dog a cat and it's clearly a dog, like that doesn't serve my readers to further 
confuse and obfuscate that truth that it's a dog. So um, I think like certainly in these early stages, as these terms get kind of pulled out of thin air, like gov governance token just kind of became the, the thing. Like ICO was the thing and then ICO was the bad word. And you couldn't say ICO, yeah. you had to say like token offer, token sale, or, you know, you could like, you know, you, you, had to, you had to dance around this, you know, this boogeyman. Um, so we're, I think we're in the business of providing for our readers, uh, you know, not like we don't want we don't want to shit on the idea of governance token. Like we don't want to be like, oh, that's dumb, that's some stupid thing. But we do want to be like an honest broker who can be like, hey, it's called a, it's called a governance token, but for all intents and purposes, at this stage, it's a growth token. It's an incentive. It's it's an airdrop. Um, so I think you're right. Like I think in the early part of like figuring out what this language is, um, you know, we need to drop the clues along the way. You know, a governance token, you know, which functionally serves as a growth token for this project. A sim like a similar analogy for me actually was, do you remember when, you remember when like Airbnb like convinced everyone to call it the sharing economy? It was like Uber came out and like Lyft came out and it's like the sharing economy. We're all sharing. It's great. Yeah. And then, you know, later the language evolved where it became the gig economy or the 1099 yeah. economy that represented some of the trade-offs that were inherent to this weird messed up system of allocating labor. So, um, you know, journalists, bought hook, line, and sinker sharing economy for like maybe two years more than they should have, right? And now you see this whole underclass of people who are scraping to get by on various gigs. Now yeah. they're right to call it the gig economy. So yeah. I think um, to me, like that's the process that we're just now beginning to see with this concept of government, governance tokens and other concepts in this space. Um, you know, we're trying to suss out what is spin from these projects, sharing economy versus yeah. what is reality, gig economy. So um, I see it as a similar process. Um, hopefully we'll be ahead of the curve on it. We could be proven wrong. Like there could be another term that comes along that, that, that ultimately sticks. Um, yeah. But it's worth thinking about how we deploy language in covering these concepts. Um, so as to not favor one side of the, or the other when we're explaining these things. That makes perfect sense. It's a sharing economy. I'm sharing a goods and service with you and you're sharing currency back for me. It's a, we're sharing, sharing is caring. We're, we're sharing. I'm sharing my car with you. You're paying me like $3 to drive like 50 miles, but we're yeah. sharing it. We're sharing at this moment. Like we're just, it just friends. obscures we're that just, economic relationship. Yeah. yeah. We're just friends. We're just picking you up, man. I feel saw you on the phone. I'm like, what's up? Let's go hang. Let's go for a ride. What do you want to listen yeah, to? Yeah, no, listen, I said, I, 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 I applaud, I applaud, um, I'm just playing the devil's advocate here. I, I, I applaud, uh, you know, when journalists do call out the bullshit, um, uh, you know, that, that, that is spit forth, uh, by, by the people, uh, uh, who, who, who it makes sense for, um, you know, so uh, now let's just talk about, you know, we have a couple minutes left. Let's just talk about, you know, the latest headlines over the past couple of days. Um, you know, one, one of the big ones that I think, um, probably, Finally, get some a pickup in the crypto sphere and in traditional media is is that leaking of FinCEN uh, documents, the thousands of yeah. FinCEN documents mm -hmm. leaked, um, that exposed to the ridiculous extent that traditional financial system is used for money laundering in the trillions of dollars. Uh, um, that that is nine hundred and ninety nine billion plus another. Um, for those who don't understand the magnitude of money laundering that's that's going on. Um, when we get events like these, where, where, where it's, it's relevant to both the, the crypto sphere and, and, and the traditional media, um, does this present, do you, do you approach those, those stories any differently than if it's just a crypto story? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have to figure out where we can enter the conversation smartly and in a way that's true to our audience. And I think this story is a fantastic example. There's a, there's a couple of ways you can go about it. The one you mentioned, just like, you know, exposing sort of the sheer might of this operation in the traditional, you know, traditional finance system. But I think another really interesting, you know, story here that, that may ring true with, with a crypto audience. And, you know, I, I'm testing this on you. You're my, you're my, you're my beta test here. Um, you know, this idea of, just the vast reams of personal data that were also compromised here, right? Like, you know, for me to get a loan or for me to do anything in this world, I have to provide all sorts of data about who I am and, and what I'm doing. Um, the cool thing about DeFi and other, other things in the, in the, in the crypto sphere is that I just need a wallet address. You know, you could like, mm -hmm. I could borrow a million dollars on compound and like if my wallet address is there and if I have the assets that that algorithm thinks like makes it worth their risk, then, then we can do that. So I think, um, you know, along with the money laundering stuff, like there's certainly like a decentralized identity angle that, you know, that might be something that we would be capable of, 
of entering into the broader discourse. And I think that's um, that's always what we try to think about. Like what you know, what's what's our what's the coin desk angle on this? Um, you know, we increasingly see ourselves as being in conversation with these bigger stories in the world of finance, but we we can't just be a we can't just be a rehash of what Bloomberg did yesterday, mm -hmm. right? So we have to find mm -hmm. we have to find an angle that um, is additive, like that adds value to the conversation. And I think uh, I think the thing around decentralized identity may be something that you'll see uh, from us in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. And you, you you mentioned this idea of you know not just rehashing but adding value and. Uh, at the beginning of the story, you you said how hey, you guys just redid your studio. Um, is, is that is is I'm assuming that's for video. Are you guys planning on leaning uh, more heavily into uh, higher video production when it does come to covering these news stories? Yeah, absolutely. So we hired um, a woman from who who ended up who previously spun up uh, Wall Street Journal Live, uh, Joanne Poe. Mm -hmm. She's great. We call her Joe Poe. We brought on Joe Poe, and she's going to run our mm -hmm. CoinDesk TV offering. Um, she helped us do our first fully remote uh, consensus this past May. We did a 24 hour broadcast around the clock, around the globe. Um, and she was the one who was, you know, behind the scenes making all that happen. So she's gonna try to, uh, well, we're all gonna try to replicate some of that, uh, that TV experience in the studio that we're building. So uh, multimedia is certainly gonna be a bigger part of the, part of the picture going forward. Uh, a lot of exciting things there to, uh, to watch out from, uh, from Coindesk. So yeah, multimedia is, multimedia is the thing. You wanna, you wanna come through? You wanna, you wanna like, you wanna do it? You want to, come, you want to, you want to move right to now, New York? We are, we are multimediaing right now. We are multimediaing. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. This this wood panel. This is this is yeah. this is the real deal right here, man. Yeah. This they they're not going to get this this in the studio. They're not going to get that brick stuff in the studio. Yeah. So this is this is a nice yeah. this is a nice way. Yeah, I'll tell you. I, I came I came from uh, Block TV, uh, which, oh, nice. which kind of kind of attempted to to do this but beforehand, and um, it, it it works really well. It, it it looks great. I do think that there is an issue when it comes to uh, attempting to do 24-7 uh, video that there just isn't that much uh, news going on. You just you end up oh, recycling yeah. we're not a lot doing, of stuff. We're not, we're not yeah. doing 24-7-365. Like, please, yeah. no. Word uh, of advice, but, do, yeah. not, do not attempt <laughs> to do that. Uh, let, me, let me give you a lesson learned. Um, it, it's just not enough at this point. The industry is too young. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so, how, so how do you guys envision yourselves doing it? Is it going to be like Vox-style kind, of, kind of video essays tackling a story or more just hi you know this is zach on the scene you know i don't i mean i don't even know what scene there could be in crypto but on the scene in front of a sushi restaurant i don't know okay. oh, i'm on the scene in front of yeah i could do like stand-ups like, like traditional like, <laughs> like like nightly news stand-ups like i'm in front of the scene on the sushi restaurant and i have my laptop and here is sushi swap like that'd be yeah. tight um i don't think it's gonna be like that um again watch out like this is all a little bit uh in the works and above my pay grade. So watch out, watch out what we, what we're going to offer. But I think it's going to be a good mix of like, it's going to be a good mix of, you know, the, the conversation with conversations with newsmakers, you know, like that's, mm -hmm. that's a staple of what you guys did for sure. Um, you know, a mix of that, like produce packages, um, a way to feature some of our reporting in a multimedia form where we can, we can do this. We can shoot, mm -hmm. we can shoot the breeze about uh, things that are going on in the space that are kind of hard to convey in the written word. So it's going to be a mix. Um, it's in the capable hands of Joe Poe, and I'm very excited to see what comes of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, last question before I let you go. Um, has, it, has it ever happened, or, or is there instances where stories, you know, reach your desk, um, and for whatever reason, they are just not allowed to see the light of day? Whether, th whether that be from uh, he heads up uh, for internal reasons, whether that be from external pressure from uh, whatever big entity or company that would look bad, or whether that be uh, governmental. I am happy to report that there's never been an instance of that. Uh, we work at an organization where we are free to pursue the stories that we pursue. Uh, we, have, we have the ability to consult with lawyers. So the only instance in which like, we would not publish something would be if the lawyers would like, this is gonna get you sued hardcore. Uh, you know, you need more sourcing here. This is not something that would stand up under the scrutiny of a court. Uh, there have been instances where that has been the case, where like we can't nail down the last source that would make it, uh, again, have that weight behind it to pass legal review. So that's the only instance, I think, from an outside entity in which we have not pursued a story, but certainly from above within the newsroom, certainly above from our parent company, uh, Digital Currency Group, there's never been any intervention or, or pressure to not cover something, which is great. So um editorial independence again it's, it goes to, like the currency like can you be a trusted news outlet like mm -hmm. like do people 
the people trust you to, to play it straight. And I mean, you know, crypto Twitter is crypto Twitter, right? Like you get it from all sides. Like, oh, you're, you're a Bitcoin shill. Oh, you're an Ether shill. Oh, like Barry's calling the shots. Um, no, nah, it's not really like that. Like we're, if we're pissing people off in equal measure, uh, which we are, believe, believe me, um, I think we're doing our job right in terms of keeping the space accountable and helping it get to a place that um, can be potentially transformative. Well, you know, Zach, I, I do appreciate you taking the time here to, to explain that to our audience, as well as uh, the tremendous work you guys are doing, uh, because that is important. Uh, just as important of a growing industry is the underlying technology, uh, the powerful players, but also uh, the coverage. The coverage, uh, that, that's what essentially explains and filters and, uh, you know, kind of passes along the truth to the people who are watching. So I appreciate you taking the time and, and the work you're doing. And for all of our viewers at Reimagine 2020, I'm Yona Hockhauser. Thanks for watching.